Welcome, welcome, welcome. Today we shall be covering a Christmas gift from my brother. He wrote it first and gave it to me. And it is The Monkey King by Wu Cheng. Written in 16th century, sometime in those like mid 1500s probably. And adapted recently for the last few decades to the story written here in English. Um, shortened tremendously because uh, it's a hundred chapters long. So, very large book. And also contains more modern dialogue and themes for, you know, the modern man. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, changed up a, a little bit, but <clears throat> keeps keeps a lot of its roots. In, the, the main story is the same. Uh, a lot of the discussions are the same. Cuts out a lot of prose and poems, although some are kept for the sake of their valuable parts of the story. Let's see if I could flip through one and read it really quick. Also, the f very front of the book features a map, which is incredibly useful for tracing the journey to the West, as the title insinuates. Um, personally, I'm very thankful when books always have maps of the front. Just because after you know a couple hours reading, it's hard to it's hard to visualize what's really going on sometimes. But this map has all the locations mentioned in the story labeled. Thus, it is very easy to follow what's going on, spanning you know several centuries and hundreds of thousands of kilometers worth mm -hmm. of story within this you know three four hundred page book. Yeah. So this is the journey to the west. It is mostly Tripitaka. He's the one who kind of starts this. You have the Monkey King, uh, his main helper, but along the lines they find Pigsy and Sandy, as well as a dragon who gets converted into a horse by the beautiful goddess Guanyin here. And what they're doing is uh, a pilgrimage to bring scrolls from the Buddhist um, Thunderclap Mountain on, no, Thunderclap Monastery on Soul Mountain and bring those over here to kind of help the people of the East who are the, like, they're growing... They're Taoists. They're Taoists, uh, yeah. They're growing into, you know, poor practices. And honestly, after reading this book, I realized it was... Um, a bit of like uh, anti-Taoist, pro-Buddhist uh, propaganda, a little bit. Because <laughs> they, mean, yeah, the story does kind of revolve around Taoist um, demons. Yeah, the main character, Monkey, his conversion from Taoism to Buddhism, mm -hmm. um, which that might have just been a historical trend during the time period it was written. Mm -hmm. um, it could have been the personal agenda of the author. Mm -hmm. Or it could have just been the most logical way for the story to flow naturally. Mm -hmm. It could be all of them. We'll never know. Yep. Yep. Um, but it doesn't just talk about Taoism, Buddhism. Another big religion that's within the story is Confucianism, which is really like familial type religion. I don't know what you know about Confucianism, but... Uh, I know it's intellectual, kind of like most religions like it involves you know big values on education and family and I think that's also what you said um, where they worship ancestral yeah. deities kind of similar to Native American religion yeah, it's, where instead of praying to a singular or conglomerate God. of gods yeah. or conglomerate of gods they pray to their ancestors rather mm -hmm. Yeah, they take a very utilitarian view on uh, religious worship and things like that. You know, uh, they try and bring it back into the house and lifestyle and really what they do every day. But um, it's kind of sprinkled throughout the whole story. Like everybody you meet uh, that has a family does a lot of Confucius like principles. You know, they're super respective of the elders um, and they're super caring and trying to take um, 
what's it called? Take care of their children. And if they're ever in any trouble or a monkey fucks with them in some way. Uh, because he does that a lot. But um, to kind of give a quick synapse of the early story, Monkey was born of a stone on this little rock right here, Flower Fruit Mountain, and some lightning happened and he hatched, I believe. Yeah, he hatched from a stone egg and his body was made of stone. Uh -huh. So it's somewhat theorized that the stone came from heaven and he's somewhat of a demigod already because yeah. all the other monkeys were born from other monkeys. through normal monkey means. Yeah, sex. <laughs> Um, anyways. Yeah, sex? I could never, bro. Anyways. Monkey business. Monkey business. He, he's living with the regular monkeys, and they have a competition who can, whoever can jump through this waterfall and say what's behind it will be the leader of our, uh, tribe. So Monkey King does it, and he becomes pronounced Monkey King as opposed to just Monkey, um, and behind that waterfall, they have their cave and their homeland, and they grow to be very strong. Uh, Monkey King then, after some time, feels concerned with this mortality deal. He's like, man, I don't, I don't like the idea of dying, so I'm gonna try and find out how to be immortal. So he leaves out. Uh, he finds this place, travels for years and years. He finds this place called the Heart and Soul Mountain, home of Sud Subodhi, and Subodhi teaches him the way of immortality and so his first Taoist master. His first Taoist master teaches yeah. him incantations and sorceries about how to transform himself, uh -huh. how to make clones, uh -huh. um, cloud uh, somersaulting. Yeah, cloud jumping and also messing with the senses of his foes and yeah. uh, making illusions. So those are his main skills and things throughout the rest of the story. But uh, he goes, he jumps back home, he finds his homies, teaches them some stuff, and back on Flower Fruit Mountain, and says, you know, I'm gonna mess with the heavens. And he goes up and says, hey, I wanna be godly. So then they give him a position as a horse, he was a stable boy. He was a stable boy in the Jade Empress Hall in heaven. In heaven, yeah. But he felt like he was in justice and that the stable boy was a wrong display of his talents. Uh -huh. But he was a monkey. Nobody trusted him. He'd just been there for a couple of years. Yeah, yeah. Um... So out of spite, he raided their orchard, magical peaches and potions, and he consumed them all and thus became even more powerful. The yeah. spells and such that he learned from Sabodi became even more stronger. And I believe at this point he had basically reached immortality from No, he reached the immortality uh, multiple times because each peach that he ate grants someone Immortality. So yeah, so ate, at this point, he's already invincible. He ate dozens of peaches. You know, he ate an whole orchard of peaches. Then uh, he drank, um, like, wines of power. There's this other guy. Yeah, it was the elixirs. Yeah, he drank all of their, their elixirs, which gave him super strength and things like that. So he became s super powerful, caused a menace, left hit on the Flower Fruit Mountain. They found out what happened. So they come down to, you know, punish him. But Monkey King, you know, through a series of battles and awesome kung fu scenes, um, they, uh, you know, they all lose. And somehow they talk with the Buddha. Buddha traps him. Yeah, the Jade Emperor sends a message to the Buddha to pursue the monkey king which is somewhat inconvenient considering the buddha lives all the way in the east of india and monkey king's all the way from wait the no west in china or no the, the west. other way around yeah, yeah the, the buddha's in the west buddha lives in the west and the monkey lives all the way in the east in china mm -hmm. but anyways the buddha uses his giant godlike hand to trap monkey within a but, mountain oh tell him about the uh the deal first 
the Buddha makes a deal with the monkey. So he, he talks with him and he says, I don't remember the deal. Hey, if you can jump to the edge of the world and jump back, then you'll be free. We'll stop bothering you. You don't have to do anything. And Monkey King's like, okay, I could jump uh, 108,000 miles easy. And the end, that's well to the edge of the world. So he goes, he jumps to the edge of the world from the Buddha's hand. The Buddha has him in his hand. And he takes a marker and does graffiti on the wall to say Monkey King was here, W-U-Z, here. And pisses on the pillar at the edge of the world and then jumps all the way back, uh, 108,000 miles into the Buddha's hand. And the Monkey King says, well, I, you must set me free now. And the Buddha says, what? but you hadn't even left my hand. And Monkey King replies, no way, I jumped all the way to the edge of the world. I know, it was, I saw the, the pillars, that barrier, and the Buddha says, look behind you. And the finger of which the Buddha had, had his uh, graffiti and piss on it. So he pissed in the Buddha's hand. And then the Buddha went and trapped him uh, to create what was now Seven Phases Mountain. And five phase mountain. Five phase mountain, right? Five phases for each finger. Um, one phase for each finger. One phase for each finger, <laughs> yes. And yeah, he stayed there for 500 years until until he was freed by Tripitaka to enlist him in his pilgrimage. Yeah, so. Tripitaka was hired by the Jade Emperor of China to get some Buddhist scrolls so they could, you know, reach enlightenment, gain immortality, things of the such. Um, and I don't recollect the reason why, but Guanyin told Tripitaka, you have to take Monkey. Monkey shall be your escort. It might have been just because he was the strongest guy around. And there's a lot of people they battle and stuff like that. They get into a lot of trouble trouble that even Monkey King can't handle sometimes. So he has to go to Guanyin to help him out. So it shows that even Guanyin is more powerful than Monkey King. Definitely smarter. Yeah. But she doesn't really get into fights. Yeah. Um, and along the way, they... Along the way to the west, where the Buddhist scrolls are, they meet two other demons that are similar in nature to Monkey. They're animals that have gained sentience and power through just, mur you know, murder and fighting and such. One what? of them is a pig man, and the other one is a sand demon. A sand monster. Yeah. Yeah, and... Uh, they also run into a dragon who becomes their horse because the dragon ate their horse. And Guanyin turned him into a horse so that... Tripitaka can ride it. But anyways, they go through, meet a lot of crazy people, experiences, stuff like that. Make it to the West. They get the scrolls. They open up the scrolls. And what they find is... They're all blank. They're blank. <laughs> they, took, they took that from Kung Fu Panda. The Kung Fu Panda took it from here. <laughs> Who knows? Art imitates life, bro. Yep. Anyways... Um, they go back to the Buddha and they're like, hey, uh, I can't read it. <laughs> it's white. <laughs> and a little upset, a little pissed because they've traveled for years and years and years. The Buddha deceived the monkey yet again, twice in this story. But, uh, I think they... I think they got some scrolls with words afterwards, even though it was only a couple. Yeah, they did. They asked the Buddha again for real scrolls, and he was like... Fine. <laughs> he was, yeah, he was really bothered and rolled his eyes and then said, fine, sure, I'll give you a couple. And then they did bring them back to China. Uh -huh. And they were utilized, and the people of China were saved from their evil Taoist ways. Yeah, by this time, Monkey and the other two demons were full-fledged Buddhists, just like Chupitaka. Mm -hmm. They were vegetarian, they meditated, and were in control of their inner emotions and thoughts. Which, um, 
most of the themes and trends throughout the story follow Monkey's transition from being a violent creature mm -hmm. to being a more civilized yeah a civilized monk yeah what I like about it is that it's just a fun goofy story it's so funny <laughs> it's very very entertaining you know I ate up the book pretty quick maybe two weeks uh, two three weeks um, and it's crazy how they've constructed you know so long ago they they put a very political order to hell and heaven and things like that and you know Wu Chenning describes the monotony that we experience here on earth will only follow us in in heaven and hell you know you all get your roles you all have to wait in lines there are lists those lists have to be followed blah 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 and monkey king being uh, the savage that he is disrupts a lot of it and uh, i find it fun you know it's kind of like a stick it to the man rebellious type of ordeal that that i i enjoy in my entertainment. yeah i agree it's definitely a satirical story about like the status quo mm -hmm. and which makes me think that like it's very common nowadays to have satire about you know we live in a society blah 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 but like at the time when this was written, I'm not sure, but this might have been, you know, some of the only source of satire. Of, political satire. Yeah. yeah, political satire of, you know, emperors and um, servants and martial arts and things of the such that people had for a while. And I wonder, like, what kind of cultural impact it had back then if people cared about that kind of stuff. Because I know for sure people nowadays do. That's why satirical shows like South Park and Rick and Morty are so popular. People eat that shit up. Mm -hmm. But this is such a timeless story that you could just change some words around like Buddhist to Democrat and it would, you know, be somewhat applicable to the modern man. Yep. Um, how has it changed our decision making? Luigi, shall I start? Do you want to start? Mm, I'll start. So, this book, this story, has reinforced some ways that I already think about things. And in general, they have to do with um, Monkey's perception on life. I think the other characters, like Tripitaka and the pig demon and whatnot, are pretty one-dimensional and predictable. Mm -hmm. But Monkey definitely changes the most throughout the story. And... He goes from being violent and rash to being thoughtful and calm and people tend to see him as a better warrior in that case and also he becomes much more shameless about asking for help from Guanyin, the other demons and Tripitaka which made me think that since this story is so timeless and ancient and well revered like it must be be completely sane and rational to agree with the fact that people who are calm and collected and okay with asking for help are typically stronger and more well liked than people who are rash, solitary, and um, violent. Yeah. Which is something that I would like to live by. Not to the extent of you know, becoming a monkey deity <laughs> or reaching enlightenment from Buddha, but just in my own little every day to day decisions. Yep, just stepping back, making sure your temper doesn't get the best of you. Because that was monkey's biggest downfall. Like, he was super powerful, but his temper was so low. He was so strong that when he would get upset about something, he would crush a mountain or smash a person to a pulp yeah, just because he could. People, like nothing, you know? Yeah. Um, and throughout the beginning of the story, he still does it. Uh, while with Tripitaka, I mean, in his journey. And Tripitaka's like, no, you can't do that. Um, sometimes, you know, he was right in, in having identified a demon and stuff like that that was trying to subdue and kill them. But um, even still... 
his rashness and quick to kill or pulverize, I should say, because sometimes they would destroy bodies, but the souls would live on and transfer to another body and some weird demon show would be happening. But he would lose trust in his friends and things like that. And constantly he would get kicked out of the, the group, come back in because they needed his help uh, and suffer different things because of it. But if he would have just been reasonable, like, hey, let's take it slow, let's talk it out. You're obviously a demon, my friends don't believe you, um, but I'm not gonna pulverize you immediately. However, uh, if you leave us alone, like, I won't pulverize you. And then maybe some better, <laughs> some better uh, instances would have occurred for him and his group instead of getting into all the trouble that they had. Because many demons that they do face up against face monkeys simply from a gr an ancient grudge that they have against him for killing other people in the past. So yeah. his um, his bad habits led to his karma and future fortune being tarnished. Yep. Um, but personally, influence on my decision making would be. hard to say i mean just more adventurous like i find myself in a continuous day-to-day -day, uh, with school and things like that but uh, i after reading it i i had made it kind of a goal to to go out a bit more and get into not necessarily trouble but sticky situations and try and learn from them you know do you mean specifically like traveling distances or just Traveling distances Doing things that you wouldn't likely do. Uh, the both. I mean, it did influence me to go to Chicago out of nowhere, really. Um, and definitely a whole array of situations and novel experiences that I was able to have from that. But it's also even in the day-to-day. -day, like, someone uh, looks like they need help, blah, blah, blah. Like, go try and see what's going on and help them out. You know, just for the sake so of So just living your life like a book protagonist. Yeah. Yeah. Pretty much. I remember in the foreword that was written in this book, mm -hmm. it was mentioning the cultural impacts um, about this story in particular. And I think that what you've discussed is probably the biggest takeaway because I remember specifically that the foreword said that this story was the inspiration for modern superheroes and superhero culture mm -hmm. like superman and things of the such and yeah. a lot of um anime as well like dragon ball obviously and dragon ball being considering big. goku is sun wukong yeah um so sun wukong is also the name yeah. given by sudoni Sud sudobi yeah subodi so this story that we've talked about today is pretty much like the you know grandfather slash tertiary source of all of or not all of but most of our childhood adventures and stories that make us feel adventurous in such a way mm -hmm. or heroic yep um like without this we probably would have grew up reading like who knows what shakespeare yeah instead of watching dragon ball and superman and stuff like that Like, this is known as the the original Chinese Odyssey, you know? Oh, Chinese Odyssey is a film uh, from 1995, cult classic. Super, lots of, just so much influence. So much influence all, all throughout modern. And that's because history. these concepts that we've discussed are pretty timeless. Like, they're things that people have probably been thinking about since ancient times and people still be doing today. Mm -hmm. um, so the timelessness is probably what makes mm -hmm. this story so culturally impactful to like, you know, historical and modern media, like mm -hmm. shows, books, movies, things as such. And just to reiterate some of those concepts and that, that is uh, kind of like the, the hero's story. You know what I mean? Have you heard of the hero story? Like that format? Uh, I've seen a couple models. Yeah, it's 
um, from what I recall, you know, you have the normal world. Yeah. You have a calling uh -huh. to to action. You go do that stuff. Um, you face some struggles. You overcome those struggles. That's the supernatural cycle. Like uh -huh. the midway point is the supernatural cycle, which yeah. is the struggle. Uh-huh. And then at the end, you return back to as a different the normal, being. Yeah, yeah different being, could, but back in the normal world. Back in the normal world with a different perspective, right? Yeah. And um, this story follows that pretty much to the T. Yeah, this story follows that to the T. So, uh, on layering, you know, the the traditional hero story that we all love to to listen to is. Um, conversations about family conversations about doing right versus wrong um, learning from your wrongs you know because the thing is everybody here messes up like to some extent like other than the jade emperor do they show like uh, they show some flaws to them for instance uh, letting monkey king uh, trick them or letting you know, demons kill them, mess with them, etc. But, you know, if they survive, they, they grow from it and they be better. Anything else? Are there other things that you might look like? Hmm. I guess what you say makes the most sense, considering Monkey makes the most mistakes, but he also becomes the strongest. Yeah. Because he learns <laughs> the most. Yeah. Yeah. The more mistakes you make, the more learning you do. Yeah. Right? What doesn't kill you simply makes you stronger. And... Mm -hmm. The Monkey King is the perfect example of that because he gets into a lot of scuffs and he almost dies a lot, but... <laughs> so much. <laughs> yeah. In the end, he comes out on top just because he was willing to grow and make friends when his gut told him not to. Mm -hmm. And it's funny because he almost dies a lot. However, he's like immortal five times over. They've tried cutting his guts out. They've tried chopping his head off. They've tried melting him and things like that. Uh, but people still find ways to eat them up or whatever, cook them and things. Or or seal them away. Yeah, that's a, that was a huge one that really messed with him, the sealing spells. Yeah, I think it was traumatized from the Buddha. Yeah. Yeah. Cool. I would like to say one last comment, but about that being afraid to make mistakes. I see it a lot, uh, at least in my class you know, um, and, or like at, at work and things like that, uh, you, know, you want to do things right the first time, and, and so the fuck what, like, make mistakes, you know, when you go and you, you study things and you're wrong, or you're, you're discussing concepts, or practicing skills, or learning a new thing, working on your car, working, uh, vehicle, etc., working, making a garden, like, Make mistakes. Don't be afraid to make mistakes. <laughs> because you learn the most. Like, if you get it right the first time, you know, by accident or because someone showed you exactly how to do it right away, then you'll quickly forget about it. But if you try something, make a mistake, try something else, make a mistake, try something else, make a mistake, try again, and finally get it right, It'll stick with you so much longer. I think I have a reason why a lot of people in our day and age think that way. Because mm -hmm. um, it's something that I've thought about too. Mm -hmm. um, I think people try striving for... Per I think people try to strive for perfection because mm -hmm. they think it's what society expects. Mm -hmm. Um... I think that a lot of people view other people's actions as being quote unquote perfect mm. because that's what they're trying to display. Mm -hmm. To be more specific, I think things on the internet, um, like videos or posts or things on television, um, like movies and TV shows and things, like typically try to display things in their most perfect sense because they have the option for that they have the option for edits and retakes mm -hmm. so the majority of people are unaware that mistakes are made mm -hmm. you know yeah. i guess a film is a pretty specific example mm -hmm. 
but people don't see the mistakes that are made during a film. They only see the perfect end. Mm -hmm. And I think people our age are kind of brainwashed by that such that everything has to be perfect the everything first time. has to be perfect the first time and that if there's a mistake along the way then it's like not a real it's not right a real goal or a real product that is being made yeah and what ends up happening is they just don't make anything you know because oh, i made a mistake i fucked it up i'm done and then that's it and then you give up but like Okay. <laughs> yeah, everybody makes mistakes. It's just most people are too scared to admit and talk about them. Therefore, they've become taboo. Mm -hmm. um, yeah. And I think if you're willing to own up to them and grow from them, like mm -hmm. Monkey was, then you'll be stronger and more confident. Mm -hmm. I get taboo looks uh, fairly frequently throughout the, the month, not like every day, um, but at least, you know, a couple times a week, I, be, people either explicitly say I'm being uh, taboo to some extent. And uh, I think, you know, like, that might be some of the times uh, I just am super quick to, tr to try shit and fail and fail and fail, you know, and like, um, it's weird to repeatedly do something again even though you're messing up and hurting yourself even you know like i remember uh trying to jump over this sign um at the school i just kept trying kept trying you know and it was to the point where i was hurting myself but fuck it <laughs> yeah it sounds more fun than doing nothing and at least in the future if you are in a situation where you do have to do something that is similar in nature, yeah. then you have more experience than someone who never tried. Yeah, exactly. Or tried once, failed, and stopped. Yeah, exactly. Mm -hmm. Like, there's worse ways to spend your time. <laughs> yeah, I agree. Cool. Well, that's all I have to say. Anything you want to say? You too, dude. All right. Well, until next time. <laughs>